morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, first session here today where um, we are going to talk to you about um, the impacts and responses uh, to public health uh, in a warmer world. Uh, we will be, we only have an hour, so uh, we will be having uh, three sections in, in some sense. The first one, uh, we will be introducing the uh, Met Office uh, University partnership or the academic partnership of the Met Office. That will be followed by a sneak peek uh, of the next health impacts assessments in the UK, uh, a sneak peek of the report, the next one, which is due in 2023. And then we will invite some reflections, very short reflex, uh, reflections from a colleague of ours uh, from a Swiss, uh, Swiss perspective. Um, so without any further delays, uh, welcome again to those who are online. Uh, can't really see you, but uh, morning and afternoon to all of you as well. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker today, uh, Professor Dan Mitchell um, uh, from the University of Bristol. He's an Alan Turing Fellow and an ERC Fellow. Uh, at Bristol, he also holds uh, the Met Office Joint Chair in Climate Hazards and is the co-theme lead of the Cabot Institute Environmental uh, Change. Uh, he's co-founder and coordinator of the Half a Degree Additional Warming Prognosis and Projected Impacts, the HAPI Consortium. Many of you uh, might already be working on it or working with them on it, uh, which is aimed at understanding uh, climate variability under the Paris Agreement uh, goals. And like many of you online and in the room, uh, he's also, many of the speakers today have also been contributing authors to the IPCC reports and uh, reviewed some of them as well. So over to you, Dan, for the first input. Great, thanks very much, uh, Rarity. So I'm, I'm, I'm Dan Mitchell from Bristol University, but I'm actually representing uh, seven institutes, and the, that's the seven institutes on the top of this slide here, and together we make up the Met Office Academic partnerships, so that's a partnership um, of, of universities in the UK working with the UK Met Office. And the first thing I wanted to mention was this animation which um, perhaps can be restarted. Um, uh, and this is uh, something that was made in, in Bristol by one of the paleo climate scientists. And they, what they were showing there was, was, was how different the two worlds could be, say, if we followed the Paris Agreement climate goals of one and a half degrees, or if we, um, uh, it, you know, if we fail to do that, which would be a sort of three degree world, which is the one on the right here. And I guess the important point to make here is that, um, especially after 2050, you see the one on the right gets redder a lot faster. So that's showing that the heat is far more intense, um, uh, you know, with the three degree world. More than that, you can see that the, the land is, wor is warming more than the oceans and that's a signal we've known about for a long time and of course we live on the lands and we live in the cities and so that really is uh, a problem and that's that's what this talk is about here it's the heat related hazards in those places that we live so i'm going to give one slide on each of the institutes so it really is a, a whistle stop tour here but this this was some research by oxford university and they looked at the number of days uh, in, in the year of 2020 that have exceeded um, 50 degrees. And 50 degrees for us in the UK, and especially here in Scotland, is just, you know, unheard of. But actually, if you look at the little blobs there in the, in the top right-hand plot, you can see um, that 50 degrees was actually exceeded a number of times in 2020, and it has been for many years. Uh, especially in the Middle East, in, in places like that. Uh, the plot down on the right is a sort of time series of, of number of locations around the globe where, where 50 degrees has been exceeded. And you can see over the last 40 years or so, that's been increasing as well. It's quite hard to put a trend in that sort of data because these extreme temperatures are sort of very noisy quantity. So, um, but there is a lot of evidence that there's a, a climate change signal there. I guess the thing about heat waves in, in health is it's not just the temperature component which is important. Um, we often talk about these things called heat stresses and uh, they take in things more than just temperature. So this is research by the University of Reading and they're looking at something which, which combines humidity, um, air temperature and sort of uh, sun, sunshine sort of uh, radiation and they've created a, a global product called Era 5 Heat, which is what you can see on the left here. So that's really 
how that's the felt temperature is the best way to think about that. And there is some evidence that that correlates more with, with health effects such as um, heat-related mortality. And we see on the, on the left-hand plot, actually this was a, this was a unprecedented heat wave in North America earlier this year, and I'm sure you're all aware of it, um, where, where some local temperatures were five degrees above the previous record. And you can see the really strong uh, heat stress signal in that, that region there. So that's the sort of global perspective, but with, with heat and health, we're really interested in what's going on at the city level. And as climate scientists, we don't really have particularly great tools for that, or, or most of our tools are not good for that. And that's because they follow this, this uh, top left-hand plot. You can see how blocky that figure is. That, that's the standard resolution of our climate models. And, um, and that's a problem because you know, cities are not resolved at all in that. So if we, if we want to understand the heat in London, we can't get it from that. So these are just two techniques. Um, the top one is one we've been developing at Bristol, which is looking at, at sort of artificial intelligence techniques to downscale to super high resolution methods um, to, to data. That's great because it doesn't require that much computational power, but it has a lot of problems. Um, you know, downscaling quantities that are physically consistent is really hard to do. The bottom way is, is the better way, and this is um, some model simulations run by the UK Met Office, it, it's super high resolution, so we call these convective permitting scales, 2.2 um, kilometers. This is sort of really the gold standard of um, local scale modeling, and they, they've done these runs for the UK, and we've got an ensemble of them. The problem with these runs is you need a very powerful supercomputer to do them, so, so, so it's hard to do the runs, and, and of course they're very limited in, in where we can do them. And I'm going to talk about those runs actually through, through most of this presentation. And this is some research actually from the, the Met Office. They've looked at two cities in this case, London on the left and, and uh, Johannesburg on the right. And they've looked at how heat in cities changes between these, this high resolution, this convective permitting model versus uh, lower resolution, older models. And the, the plot on the bottom right is the diurnal cycle of temperature in Johannesburg. So the diurnal cycle is just the temperature evolution throughout the day. So, so the x-axis here is the uh, hour of the day. And if we just concentrate on the bottom two lines here, so the, the past, we can see that the two models, so the circle is the new convective permitting model, the squares are the, are the older models. We see the convective permitting model is actually cooler throughout that diurnal cycle. So what that's saying is we do need these high resolution models to get the urban heat island uh, better, but perhaps surprisingly to some of you, it actually produces cooler temperatures in the, in the better models. Uh, and we, we, we understand that and I, I can explain more afterwards. So this uh, following on from that, Leeds have done some work, uh, again with these convective permitting models, slightly different resolution, but they're looking at heat waves across the whole of Africa, and the, the domain here on the right is, is their model domain that they're looking at. And again, they've looked at these things uh, I talked about earlier, humid heat waves. So it's heat waves where you have that humidity component as well, and you might feel is, is more appropriate for health. And what they found is that um, those humid heat waves are actually better produced in the convective permitting model. They found not much of a difference if you just look at basic dry heat waves, but for the humid heat waves, they're better reproduced and they actually see a larger uh, change in the future, so an uh, increase in those humid heat waves. And I guess, you know, one of the points of the research from Leeds here is that just because you're resolving the fine scales, such as the city level uh, data, um, that does project onto the much larger scale um, uh, events as well. So they see an improvement in large-scale heat waves in, in these models. So UCL is the next one, and UCL lead the Lancet countdown um, uh, on climate change, and I'm sure many of you here are aware of that and indeed contributed to that. And two of the figures I wanted to highlight here were, were taking the, the temperature data 
that we've observed in the exposure and taking it to the sort of hazard level. And so on the, le on the left here, I've got a, a mental health aspect of heat waves, and on the right, I've got a physical health aspect. And the left-hand plot was a, a collection of tweets using uh, machine learning techniques, so they trawled through Twitter during heat events, and they looked at the sentiment of people. Were, were they giving negative or positive expressions during those heat waves? And you can see on here that there's a, a, a real increase in um, negative expressions during heat, and especially in 2020, they saw a 155% increase in sort of negative tweets towards that, those heat events. They, they were across the globe, but of course, are focused more on, on where people use Twitter. On the right is looking at more of a physical loss of heat waves, and the y-axis here is the um, average uh, activity lost per person uh, per day. And the first thing you can note is the y-axis goes up to four. Um, and so that's four hours per day lost of outdoor labor. Uh, that's half a day's worth of work. And if you stratify that by uh, the income of the country, and, and the red is the sort of lower income countries, you see that they're the worst hit, and you see uh, an upward trend there again um, over the last um, 20 or, or so years. So that's a, that's a significant problem that we need to, to think about. Moving on to, to the research at Bristol University, so this is my university. Um, we're then taking it, I guess, to the ultimate uh, physical impact of, of heat, and that, that's mortality. And on the left is a study we did, uh, an event attribution study, these are called. So this is where we look at a very specific event, in this case, 2003, and we modeled the mortality of that uh, event as it would have been with all greenhouse gases, but also as it would have been if we'd never emitted greenhouse gases. And so we can then, we can then partition that into how many people died because of the climate change component of, of the heat wave. And this was the first event attribution study looking at uh, the impacts in this way. And you can see that in London and Paris, uh, a third to a half of the mortality was because of the enhancement of climate change. So we're talking a lot already about these impacts. And this, this was 20 years ago now, this event. So we've detected these mortality impacts quite far back already. On the right is a plot from one of my postdocs, Eunice Lowe, and this is essentially taking that methodology but looking into the future. So this is, this is a map of North America, and I've deliberately not included the numbers on this, um, but each blob here is a different city. The outer, the outer circle is the number of deaths, it's three degrees warming. So number of deaths if we don't, um, if we don't change our carbon commitments. The next inner one is the number of lives we would save if we stabilized at the lower Paris Agreement climate goal of one and a half degrees, and the one that in is, is a two degree limit. The first thing you can see for this is New York sticks out like a sore thumb, um, and that's just because of the population size of New York. But other cities such as Miami also stick out. Um, and the size of these curves, the size of these circles depends on the population the type of exposure in the city, so how vulnerable that city is to climate change, and then the actual climate change signal itself, so how much temperature is, is varying. So this is just across the US, but if we could make such a map for Africa, it would be very different as well. So, so Exeter have almost taken this to the next step, and they've developed a, a, a user-friendly tool here to uh, look at impacts of, of heat, um, maybe excess deaths like what I showed in the previous slide, but also things like hospitalization. And so you can take in some inputs. They use high resolution climate projections, much like the projections I've shown uh, in the previous slide, um, building characteristics, so things like air conditioning, and then you can select which year you want to look at. And um, on the bottom right here is that sort of interface which uh, would then give you your impact for the very local level. And this is the Bristol region that they, they focused on, which they're working with at the moment. So sort of final slide here, this was just a, a note I put in Nature Climate Change earlier this year. 
Um, and this is where I see one of the real problems, and I'm, I'm probably preaching to the converted here, and that no one would dispute this. Every country in orange here is country we're really struggling to get daily mortality data, and we need that for this sort of analysis. Um, Africa obviously sticks out like a sore thumb there. And the red blobs I put on here are the largest projected increases in population over the next 50 years. And you can see they all match up with these countries where we don't have the relevant data. So that's a sort of serious problem. So just to sum up here, um, we've already experienced heat mortality. We've already detected it in climate change. Um, and we're going to get a lot more of that in the future. But I would argue we're decades away from understanding the complexity of, of even the temperature component of climate and health here. The second point I wanted to raise is, you know, a lot of these studies have come out with joint supervision between climate experts and health experts. And I think that's such an important point. Uh, I've reviewed papers myself where I felt they haven't had the relevant climate expertise on. I know my health expert colleagues have done exactly the same in the opposite way. And then finally, just again to reiterate, you know, the best way to solve this is, is to get to net zero as fast as possible. And we're talking about thousands of, of deaths here, uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths. It's, an, it's not a small number at all, and just want to make that point. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. And uh, to all the colleagues who are also online, I know that a number of people from this partnership are online and in attendance. So thank you very much. And thank you also for um, the succinct yet comprehensive uh, overview of the range of activities that the universities uh, are, are, are undertaking. And with this, we will move on to the next uh, very concrete example of how the Met Office uh, universities across the UK and uh, the UKHSA, which many of you will know as Public Health England, which is the national public health institution of the UK, have come together uh, to look at the uh, health impacts of climate change uh, in the UK. So this is the fourth iteration of the report, and we, we are, as I said before, offering a sneak peek of the early findings. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't have be introducing individual speakers, but uh, if we can have the uh, speakers um, uh, on, on screen, uh, we have uh, Helen McIntyre, uh, who is on the right uh, top corner here. Uh, Helen, if you can just wave your hand. Uh, we have, yeah, that's, uh, then we have Christina Mitsukau, uh, also from U UK HSA, who will be talking to us about the air quality. Helen will talk about the temperature uh, impacts. Uh, Christina will talk to us about the air quality one. Um, Jolion Medlock uh, and Emma Gillingham will talk to us about the vector bone diseases uh, in the UK. And to my right here in presence, Pauline from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who will talk to us about the food systems impacts. And uh, please, all of you, if you can introduce yourself and uh, pass the baton to each other. So over to you, Helen, um, for your uh, presentation and introduction of the, of the report in uh, uh, short uh, <laughs> slides. Over to you. Okay, thanks. Can I check you can hear me first of all? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So thanks very much, everyone, to, for attending today. Um, as Rota said, my name is Helen McIntyre. I'm a senior environmental scientist in the Climate Change and Health Group at UKHSA. Um, my background is very much atmospheric science and modelling, um, and I've moved across to the public health sphere for several years now. So I'm just going to briefly introduce the report overall, and then I'll go on to talk about some of the temperature effects. So if you have the third slide, please. Next one, please. Great. So this is uh, so that the main thing we're going to be talking about now is the health effects of climate change in the UK report. Um, so there have been three reports on this published before. So the most recent one is the third um, health effects report, or HEC report, as you'll probably hear it referred to quite a lot, uh, which was published in 2012. And you can find that at the below link here, and it's also relatively easy to Google as well. So this is a UK-focused report on the health impacts relating to climate change in the UK. And it covers all different topics, um, so ones you might expect, like heat and cold and flood, and also things like air pollution, vector-borne disease, foodborne illness, aeroallergens, drought, uh, and many more. So this really aims to comprehensively synthesize and also provide new analysis on health effects of climate change. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this here gives you some of the policy backgrounds of this report and where it sits within the various cycles relating to the Climate Change Act. So the orange and red bubbles here are the different reports that we're talking about. And you can see where they fall in the cycle of the Climate Change Act and also the Climate Change Risk Assessment and the NAP cycles. And also alongside that are the UK climate projection releases, which are the, the green parts here. So we have the 2002 report with the, 20, uh, with the 2002 projections, and then an update to the report re was released in 2008 to coincide with the UK Climate Change Act. And then uh, the last report followed the UK CP09 projections released. So the current fourth iteration is one of the key deliverables for UK HSA under the second NAP commitment. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm now going to talk briefly about some of the temperature related work that I've been doing. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge um, others on here who've been jointly doing this analysis, particularly uh, Penny and Nevin, as well as everyone else for their support in this work. And also just to note that the results here are preliminary and are still going to subject to some further finalisation. Next slide, please. So hot weather and high temperatures can lead to a range of negative effects on health, including increases in mortality, exacerbating lung and cardiovascular conditions. And this can also increase demand for health service by increasing number of hospital admissions, which can also put pressure on emergency services. There are those who are, who are more vulnerable to the effects of heat and therefore more at risk. And this can include older people, particularly those over 75, as well as babies and young children. Uh, people with serious chronic conditions, uh, including things like dementia, heart or breathing problems, and also people with serious mental health problems or who are on certain medications too. Um, in the UK, the state of the climate report from the Met Office, as well as IPCC reports, show that temperatures are increasing over the UK already. Um, we've seen previously this week that we know that over land, the global mean is actually already at 1.5 degrees and temperatures are projected to rise across all regions of the UK, with heat waves becoming more intense and frequent. So in order for us to minimise the impact of these increasing temperatures on health, we are going to have to adapt to some of these changes, but also in tandem pursue mitigation efforts to minimise the level that we will need to adapt to. Uh, next slide, please. So to support the NAP commitments that we outlined earlier, we've been working on a detailed quantitative health impact assessment for the UK. So for this, we've used the latest observed uh, health data that's available, the ratified official figures. And then from this, we've used, um, we've used this to calculate new epidemiological response relationships for different regions of the UK. So you, there are a couple just shown here. You can see the two figures with the, with the red curves on them. Uh, for London and the West Midlands. And you can see here that there are increasing effects on mortality as temperatures are, are higher or lower. So what we've done is with these new coefficients, we've applied these to the daily gridded temperature projections from UK CP18 projects, combining with a detailed population weighting to estimate the exposure. And we've also applied different bias correction techniques to the, the gridded data. Uh, next slide, please. So our provisional results suggest that heat-related mortality will approximately triple in the UK by the 2050s. This is assuming no adaptation at this point. Um, and the spread here that you can see on these figures represents the range of the 12 different climate model realisations that we used. Um, and the work contributes to building the evidence, race, uh, the evidence base about quantifying the future health impact um, from climate change. And health impact assessment for governments is one of the key uh, health priorities in the COP Health Programme. And also, this really does underline quite clearly why we do need adaptation measures in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So as we said at the start, and this has been highlighted uh, as well as in, in Dan's talk, uh, we're, we're working now to look at how we can model adaptation and uh, to explore uh, what kind of methods we can use to do this um, and its effect on future health burdens. So this is work that's ongoing now um, and we're planning to do this through a scenario-based approach where we can use more tailored assumption, assumptions relating to things like thresholds, underlying vulnerabilities um, and also adaptive measures. So this should be some exciting work coming out soon. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand over to Christina, who's going to talk about some of the air pollution work. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Yes, Christina. 
Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dr. Christina Mitsaku. Uh, I'm a senior environmental public health scientist in the Air Quality and Public Health Group of uh, UK Health Security Agency. And my background is in atmospheric science, air pollution, exposure modeling. Um, and today I would like to present you briefly uh, this work for the uh, health effects of climate change report in relation to the air quality, uh, which is uh, led jointly with the climate change group and the air quality group. Um, so I hope you can see my slides. I will go to the next one, please. Thank you. Uh, let me start first from uh, the reason that we study air pollution in the frame of climate change. Um, and first, there are uh, some common uh, sources of air pollutants and climate emissions. And I would like to highlight the transport and the energy generation sectors that have a large contribution both to air pollution and climate emissions. So it makes sense to look at these in parallel. Uh, it is also very well known that the exposure, uh, both uh, long and short term, uh, to air pollution has several direct impacts on health, such as triggering of respiratory conditions like asthma, cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, and there is also emerging evidence for associations with dementia, low birth weight, and other conditions. So uh, air pollution affects us throughout our lifetime, even from the very early stages until the old age. Uh, so considering these mitigation actions for climate are likely to have benefits to health through uh, improvements in air quality. And next, uh, next slide, please. The interactions between climate change and air pollution have been studied and we have some recent publications uh, in the UK. I would like to mention the report by the Air Quality Experts Group that looked at the net zero policies and expected impacts on air quality. And among their key findings, uh, they included the, the benefits from the decarbonization of the transport fleet, but they also report areas that should require special attention in order to avoid any unintended consequences to air quality. Uh, policies with clear co-benefits for air quality and climate change are also presented in the very recently published work by the Royal Society, where it is reported that without the, the policies and considering only the climate change, we should expect in the summertime uh, more frequent intense heat waves and so more ozone and particulate matter episodes. Uh, but in the winter time, uh, maybe the situation will improve with less cold stagnant conditions and so less pollutant accumulations. Uh, next slide, please. It is the transport day of the event today, and uh, as I mentioned, transport is one of the main sources of air pollution and climate emissions. Uh, so we have been looking at the health effects in order to be able to suggest actions that would improve air quality and health, as we did in uh, the review of exposure in different transport modes, where we also took into account the hierarchy of interventions from the work that we carried out on reviewing the policies that improve air quality. And on the right side, uh, it is a work with a committee on the medical effects of air pollution, pollutants, uh, where we summarized the evidence on the effects associated with non-exhaust particulate matter of, uh, from uh, road transport. And this is an important uh, area if we consider the fact that the traffic uh, volume is focused to grow in the future and uh, current projections show consequent increases in non-exhaust emissions. Next slide, please. So uh, for our work here, uh, we're building on what has been done so far, and we work on some key areas in order to develop further the evidence, especially in relation to health and inequalities linked to uh, air pollution in the climate change context that haven't uh, been thoroughly discussed in recent publications. Uh, so we estimate future air quality health burdens in the UK, and from the recent study, it was found that in 2050, worsening uh, harmful ef effects from increases in ozone uh, should be expected, but reductions in long-term effects from fine particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide. We currently carry out health impact assessments based on the most up-to-date information on the air pollution projected emissions, exposure response functions, and with high spatial resolution in order to capture the exposure differences across the population. So we will update uh, our findings. Next slide, please. 
Then we're also looking on investigating the effect modification of ozone by temperature, as there is uh, some evidence that short-term health effects of ozone are modified by temperature. In particular, uh, health effects uh, are exacerbated on hot days. Uh, but a full review of the literature has not been carried out at this stage, and this was a recommendation for future work in the 2015 report by the Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollutants. So we investigate changes in correlations of ozone with other pollutants as temperature changes, and this uh, might explain greater apparent effects of ozone on higher temperature days. Next slide, please. We also plan to study the impact of transboundary pollution to health, and we will focus on the naturally produced particles, uh, like desert dust and volcanic ash. And we will also explore uh, pot potential overlaps of this work with other areas covered in the report, like the wildfires. And we will be also looking, uh, investigating the inequalities among and across the populations uh, throughout our work. And next and final slide, please. So, uh, summarizing, I would just like to emphasize that improvements in health from better air quality are important mutual benefits from efforts to reduce climate emissions, and so they can bring, uh, they can be strong motivators for countries to take more ambitious policy action on climate change. Using uh, the most up-to-date information and data, we aim to provide robust evidence on health impacts to support policymakers and negotiators in COP26 ambitions. And while at the same time we need to investigate the impact of climate change and relevant policies on environmental health inequalities. And thank you. And I would like to pass over to Jolie on the demo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I can have my first slide, please. My name is Jolie Medlock. I'm head of medical entomology uh, within the UK Health Security Agency. And I'm going to be presenting with Emma Gillingham as part of the climate change team. And we're going to be talking about the impact of um, climate and environmental change on vector-borne disease risk in the UK. And this is a collaboration for the chapter with colleagues at the University of Liverpool and also for the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. So just a little definition first, vector-borne disease, a vector is any agent that carries and transmits a pathogen. So here we're talking about arthropod vectors, primarily mosquitoes and ticks. I will cover mosquitoes, Emma will cover ticks. And these have changed dramatically in their distribution in Europe in the 21st century. If we look at the first decade, we've seen the uh, establishment and expansion of invasive mosquitoes and outbreaks of chikungunya, tropical viruses, chikungunya in 2007 in Italy. If we move on to the, the second decade. Next slide, please. The emergence of blue tongue virus, a, a virus of Africa in, in a veterinary disease. In, in parts of Europe and also the, the emergence of Schmalenberg virus really brought home the fact that Northern Europe was prone to the incursion of uh, vector-borne disease issues. We also had our first outbreak of dengue in Madeira, a first outbreak in Europe for 90 years. Move on to the, the next slide, please. And more recently, we've seen uh, an increase in the distribution and number of cases of West Nile virus. Normally, we would have 200 to 700 cases, and this has now expanded to 2,000 cases for the emergence of West Nile virus in Northwest Europe, in places like Netherlands and Germany. And the emergence of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus transmitted by ticks, causing fatalities in Spain. Next slide, please. So I want to consider, first of all, West Nile virus. West Nile virus is a uh, mosquito-borne flavivirus of birds that can cause zoonotic disease. It was notable in the first part of this century, causing 40,000 human cases in North America um, and about 1,600 deaths. And now, as I've said, it's emerged in Europe with increasing numbers of cases. There were 2,000 cases, uh, human cases in 2018 associated with the heat wave event. The main vector for West Nile virus in Europe is Culex modestus. We established surveillance for mosquitoes, nationwide surveillance, um, over 10 years ago now and detected Culex podestas for the first time occurring in the Thames estuary. We now know that this mosquito is established in North Kent and also along the Essex coast. Since then, we've been monitoring changing mosquito abundance, working with local authorities to build resilience to deal with uh, the emergence of, of mosquito biting, and also developing guidance for wetland managers to ensure that we can uh, progress with environmental change on wetland creation and management without creating uh, unnecessary human issues. Uh, related to West Nile virus. The outbreaks in the Netherlands and Germany have identified that really the UK is not far away from local transmission of West Nile, and we had our own emergence of the Sutu virus 
uh, in 2020. Move on, please. What about the future climate risks? Well, our college at Centre for Ecology and Hydrology have done some recent modelling using the latest climate predictions. Current temperatures are considered too low for epidemic transmission of, of West Nile virus in establishment. But introductions are likely to come from migratory birds sort of in late May and the transmission from those birds through to um, mosquitoes. So we can model this, we would expect some local transmission by the end of 2039, increasing risk by 2069. But if we see a lengthening of the mosquito season of Culex pipiens, which is the enzootic vector that transmits the virus between birds, this might bring this forward by two decades. Our next steps really are to improve our understanding of the suitability and modelling of Culex modestus and identify those communities most at risk of West Nile virus transmission. Next slide, please. As well as our native mosquitoes, we also have invasive mosquitoes. Aedes albopictus being uh, the primary invasive mos mosquito of concern. You can see there a map from the European Centre for Disease Control that has shown since the uh, first detection in 1990, this mosquito has spread along highway systems and trucks and vehicles to 30 European countries. It is known as a vector of dengue, chikungunya, and to lesser degree, Zika virus. And these are now emerging in Europe. I mentioned already the outbreak of dengue on Madeira in 2012. We also had outbreaks in two notable outbreaks in Italy in 2007, 2017, of chikungunya virus. And there are local transmission now of dengue, chikungunya and Zika in Spain, Italy and France. We established surveillance for this mosquito in 2010 and uh, detected it for the first time in 2016. Since then, we've had six occasions where they've been detected and working with local authorities to implement continuous planning to control the mosquito to prevent establishment. Move on, please. So what about the risk of this mosquito and few other mosquitoes coming into the country? Some work previously done that we're looking to update using the climate predictions in 2009 has shown that actually there's current suitability in London and the urban centres in the southeast and south coast, which is where much of our surveillance is focused. But you can see here that a one degree temperature change would lead to an extra one to two weeks of activity and increasing suitability by 15% for the mosquito across the country by 2030, 2050. And a two degree temperature change doubles that to three to four weeks. 25 to 30%. Now there's another component of this, which means actually um, if the mosquito establishes, will we actually have transmission of the virus? And we're now working on models looking at viral transmission and the incubation of those viruses within the mosquitoes. Some European models suggest that we may see um, four weeks of uh, chikungunya transmission by 2041 or four to 12 weeks by 2071. But other work looking at vector competence studies and infecting mosquitoes in the lab at various temperatures suggest that by 2080, we may be still unsuitable for Zika virus. So these are our next steps, modeling dengue and chikungunya vector competence in the UK. And I pass on to Emma for some work on ticks. Thanks, Julian. Um, as, as Julian said, my name is Emma Gillingham and I'm a senior environmental scientist in the Climate Change and Health Group at the UK HSA. Um, so the, um, so as, as Julian said, I'm gonna be talking about ticks today. Um, so if we can go to the slides, please. So the most common tick species that we have in the UK is Ixodes ricinus, and this tick species is better known as the deer or sheep tick, and it's a vector of Lyme disease. And this species of tick spends approximately 98% of its life cycle off of the host and is very sensitive to changes in the weather when it's off the host. So we've done some analyses to understand the effect that weather has on the seasonality of this species, which is shown in the, in the first graph on the slide. And we found that during 2014, which was a particularly wet and warm winter, the peak in tick activity occurred much earlier than in other years during our four year study. And this also had a knock on effect with the peak of Lyme disease cases also occurring earlier that year. And we've also found that um, temperature has a positive effect on tick activity, tick bite reports and Lyme disease cases, again, highlighting the influence that weather can have on tick activity. And it's important to understand how a change in climate affects the seasonality of ticks, because this will alter when people are at risk of being bitten and possibly infected with a tick-borne disease. One of the difficulties with understanding the impact that climate change has on vector-borne diseases is that there are many non-climate drivers which can also affect transmission. So the graph on the bottom corner of this slide shows the results of a study where we looked at ticks, tick distribution across different habitat types in southwest England over a five-year period. And what we found, we looked for the uh, bacteria that causes Lyme disease within these ticks, which is uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. And we found that between years, there was variation in the, in the bacteria, but also we found variation between habitat types as well, with some habitats being much more high risk than others. And so this highlights the importance that land use 
change as well as climate change may play in the future in terms of tick-borne disease risk in the UK. Next slide, please. So as well as considering our native ticks, we also have to consider non-native ticks, which, uh, which are not currently present in the UK because they're unable to survive due to our climate. And one of the non-native tick species that we're, um, we're concerned about is uh, Hyloma marginatum. And this tick species is currently found in parts of Southern Europe, Northern Africa and parts of Asia and is a vector of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. We've previously detected individuals of this species in the UK, which have arrived on either migratory birds or imported animals. And whilst our climate is currently too cold for the tick to be able to survive and establish, heat wave years such as in 2018 have been warm enough for it to be able to molt from the nymph stage to the adults. And it's the adult stage that are most likely to bite people. And one of our concerns with climate change is that the UK will become warm enough for this species to be able to survive and establish. And so we've conducted some modelling using the UK CP18 data to understand whether this will be possible in future. So a previous study has found that temperatures during September to December are cru crucial to the survival of this species. And in areas where Hyloma marginatum is established, temperatures during September and December exceed 800 cumulative degrees. And so we've done some calculations using the UK CP18 projections to understand whether in the UK in the future, whether we'll reach that temperature, that crucial temperature, um, which could see some establishment in the UK. And we found that whilst the temperatures in the UK will increase, it's unlikely that they'll reach this 800 cumulative degrees that is required for establishment. And so it's unlike, so it's based on the projections, it's unlikely that the UK will be warm enough for long-term establishment of this species. So um, I'll now hand over to Pauline. Uh, thank you very much, um, Emma. So my name is Pauline Schubig, and I work at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine in the Centre on Climate Change and Planetary Health. And we've worked uh, on the nutrition, food system and nutrition chapter of the HEC report. I don't know if my slides... There we go. Um, uh, so these are uh, preliminary uh, uh, results, as um, Rabti was saying at the at the beginning, and might uh, change a bit over the uh, over the coming years when we are further developing the report. Uh, but this is the team within the London School and also at UXA uh, that uh, have been working with us on this. Um, so the impact of uh, climate change on uh, nutrition is uh, not a direct one. There is uh, uh, some evidence that uh, increased heat and, and drought might, uh, for example, uh, make people very thirsty and, and, and hot and hence consume more uh, uh, soft drinks and that has a link to obesity, but far more the impact is through uh, the food system and so the production of food and the impact of climate change on uh, what we can grow in the world. And if we talk about the UK and the impact of climate change on nutrition and health in the UK, this is often not about uh, the foods that we are producing in the UK itself, but it's the foods that we are uh, importing from elsewhere uh, from countries that are much more uh, climate vulnerable and uh, dealing with a uh, lots of issues around uh, water scarcity, for example, uh, uh, changing precipitation patterns, higher temperatures that uh, jeopardize their production, and hence there might be disruptions in, in supply. And uh, this is a map uh, showing uh, under a uh, uh, plus three degree scenario uh, how yields of cereals would change in the world. And you see that that is indeed not in, in, in the UK and many European countries, but uh, when we are um, importing from further afield, um, we see um, some forecasts that show uh, major uh, yield reductions uh, from these countries if uh, they are also supplying, of course, uh, the, which is a problem, poses a problem in the countries itself, but also for the UK if we are importing from them. So it's very important if we would like to um, uh, measure the health effects of climate change through the uh, food system in the UK that we know two things. One, uh, what are we uh, what are we eating and what we'll be eating in the future or what do we want people to eat in the future? And secondly, where is that coming from and how are we uh, changing uh, the way how we source food, where is it produced and are we increasingly sourcing from countries that are climate uh, vulnerable? And then ultimately, how does that have a 
uh, an impact on, on trade, on supply, on food prices and affordabilities and inequalities of uh, healthy access, uh, access to healthy foods in the, in the UK. Well, we are not eating very healthy in the UK to, to start with. On the left-hand side, you see what we should be eating. On the right-hand side, what we are eating. And we're not eating enough uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, we're eating too much uh, foods that are high in fat and, and sugar. And uh, we do know uh, that, for example, fruits and vegetables um, also very much work um, the other way around. So uh, diets that are lower in animal source foods and higher in plant-based foods um, uh, also have a more positive or emit lesser uh, greenhouse gas emissions on average and, and would also therefore be a, a mitigation strategy. And we do see in the UK that this also very much varies by uh, socioeconomic group, by income, for example, but also uh, different ethnic groups and geographical areas. And this is an example of fruit and vegetables uh, where we see that, uh, for example, in Northern Ireland, uh, the consumption of fruit and vegetables is very low. But this is changing. So what we've done uh, for this uh, uh, chapter of the Hack Report is looking at forecasts of what we will be eating in the future, comparing the baseline uh, uh, around now or a few years ago to uh, what it will be uh, at the end uh, of 2030, more or less. And then we see that diets are changing. They seem to be getting healthier. There's more fruit and vegetables um, and less meat and high fat and sugar uh, foods. However, uh, the question is now, where are the, these coming from? Uh, this is, for, from a health perspective, a, a, a positive impact. But uh, would these foods, if uh, people would adhere to such diets, would, for example, fruits and vegetables be something that uh, is affected by um, uh, resilience of the supply chain uh, because they are coming from countries that are having a, uh, a larger impact of climate change on their, on their yields and on their production systems? Uh, and we do see that these are uh, these projections, by the way, are not uh, very equal across different socioeconomic groups, but uh, show uh, more of an increasing trend in high incomes than in low incomes. So how do we measure that? Well, we used two indices uh, to look at uh, climate vulnerability of a supply of uh, food groups. On the left-hand side there, uh, you see the ND Gain uh, Country Index, which is a climate change vulnerability index, but which also takes into account the adap uh, adaptive capacity of countries. And on the right-hand side, the Water um, Scarcity Index by the World Resources Institute. Um, uh, so the Climate Vulnerability Index that the UK has uh, quite a resilient score, 70, it's a theoretical score from 0 to 100, uh, and uh, 70 is, is quite high on that scale. And then you see uh, that uh, if you take into account where we are getting um, the supply of each of these foods from, uh, that our vulnerability score goes down, which is, means worse, uh, when we are importing more from climate vulnerable countries. And you see that the the foods that we like people to eat and that are also projected that we will uh, eat more of those in the future are actually more in that climate vulnerable group. So the, the legumes, the, the fruits, uh, and to a certain extent also the vegetables are a bit lower down there. Uh, water scarcity index, the uh, UK is, is relatively water um, uh, abundant, so they have a score of two from a scale from one to five. And then you see that again, fruits and vegetables, because they're imported from uh, more climate vulnerable countries uh, uh, show much higher uh, uh, water scarcity scores uh, there. And uh, these are also, there are some trade offs there. So some uh, score higher uh, or better on the climate vulnerability um, uh, index than on the water index, and vice versa. Well, where so, well, whereas some, such as nuts and seeds and fruits, kind of sc score quite poorly across the, the board. So uh, with those larger food groups, and we will uh, further refine these, uh, these models in the year to come, uh, we looked at uh, would an average diet, if we compare that uh, current diet to a diet in 2030, then on average have worse climate vulnerability sc scores and worse water uh, scarcity uh, scores. And we see that, in, in fact, the changes are, are marginal, and that's because uh, there was also quite an, an, uh, a large increase in in milk and dairy, which is mo mostly produced uh, in, the, in the UK. But we do see some uh, differences, and 
uh, perhaps not, not uh, very clear in these figures, but between the different income turtles. So uh, it, for people in the lowest income turtle, uh, their, the diets or their preferred diets or the projected diets are more vulnerable uh, to, uh, to climate change and, and, uh, or uh, pr more reliant on production from countries that are vulnerable to climate change and hence therefore might potentially uh, see disruptions in their supply uh, earlier on and, and, and uh, with, for example, increases in prices. And this, these are the results if we don't change imports, and we actually do. Um, uh, we have been increasingly importing from countries uh, that are uh, uh, climate vulnerable. This is the, uh, a picture of where we were importing fruits and vegetables from in the 1980s, and this is uh, where we are um, importing them from in the, in the 2010s, and uh, the, the dashed ones are uh, uh, countries that are considered as highly or moderately climate vulnerable, and that, that supply has doubled. So if that uh, goes on, then you see that uh, those differences in, in, in vulnerability scores will, will go up and will get worse uh, for diets that are higher, for example, in fruits and vegetables, which is something that we want from both a health and environmental perspective. So we will further refine these models, uh, looking at specific uh, sub-food groups within the larger food groups and also uh, more specifically production areas uh, that we have. Then we will look at different dietary patterns in the UK and of course uh, we'll then also look at what sort of health impacts uh, these might have in the, in the long run. Um, so I'll leave you with uh, the summary and I'll hand over to you, Robert. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, all the panelists. If we can have all the panelists uh, on the screen, please. And bad chairing. Uh, uh, we did run out of time, but we did start four minutes late. So if you can hold on for four more minutes beyond uh, our time. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, for all the panelists for this excellent presentations. And I will hand over to Sonia, who will uh, uh, provide a short reflection of how uh, you see it from your Swiss perspective. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so I mean, it's very much Jim provides in the sense that uh, I've just seen the presentation, but I think that was really fascinating to see all what is being done in this area. And I think we do see that there are major impacts of uh, emissions uh, of greenhouse gases, uh, obviously on heat, but also pollution, vector burns, uh, disease, and food. Uh, so I was involved in the IPCC uh, report uh, that was published uh, in August. It's certainly one main conclusion is that changes uh, in heat is a major impact of, of climate change. And just to give some numbers, uh, uh, so basically at, uh, for uh, events that would have happened only once every 10 years, now they would happen uh, three times every 10 years. 1.5 degrees, it would happen four times every 10 years, and at two degrees, six times. So actually, if we want to avoid having the majority of summers, uh, uh, including heat extremes, then it would be better to avoid uh, two degrees. So again, I think we have seen uh, really a, a number of uh, fascinating uh, points. Uh, I really like also the last point where we see that uh, we are dependent. I think that's the case in the UK, but also in other countries. Uh, we shouldn't focus only on the impacts that are happening in our own countries. Uh, I think we see this, for instance, with food imports, and that was also an important conclusion of the last IPCC report that we are starting to look at compound events, for instance, events that are associated with the uh, co-occurrence of extremes in different locations. One other conclusion of the report was that, for instance, at two degrees, we would have much more probability of having extremes at the same time in different food-producing uh, countries. Uh, and so this means also risk for food security. And for instance, the special report from IPCC on land came to similar conclusions. So I would say all of this shows that it's really worth limiting uh, global warming. We need to act now. Uh, we know uh, any additional uh, amount of uh, global warming is going to lead to more impacts. And that's why I really hope this COP also is going to be successful in uh, reaching some, some uh, limitations of uh, emissions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia, uh, for those um, comments. And now, uh, in the interest of time, I will open the floor to any questions, uh, first from the room, and if there are any uh, on, online, then I would need help with somebody reading out uh, those to us. Any questions in the room? Okay, so I'll first hand over to you, if you can briefly say who you are, and then ask your question. And then, from and then Andy. Yeah. So my, my name is Jim O'Donnell. I'm a professor at the University of Connecticut. Uh, the, uh, I wondered if you could comment on whether or not you think uh, that, that transportation of foods and 
well, transportation causes about 30 percent, at least, of CO2 emissions. And if we're going to reduce CO2 emissions substantially, we've also got to reduce it in that sector. And that's going to affect uh, the, 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 the availability of, of food that in your analysis. And I wondered if you had thought, or is it in the, in the assessment, what the future transportation impacts will be on food security in parts of Europe and even in Africa and elsewhere? This is it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that that definitely is a is an important um, uh, part of food system. For um, if you look at the UK, and especially given that um, uh, most of the animal sourced uh, foods are um, are produced in the in the UK itself, um, uh, there will uh, there, there will be um, a bit of an element there. Once you move away from animal source foods that are produced in the own country, go to plant-based foods, and, and often these uh, calculations are, are based on, um, uh, on, on averages where about um, uh, emissions on farm, but not so much in transport are, are, are considered. So there is an added element there where you uh, move away from products that are um, produced in your own country to products that are more sustainable, but perhaps produced uh, further away. But in the grand scheme of things, transport is a much smaller percentage of the food system's emissions than, uh, uh, than the, the on-farm emissions of, animal, uh, of, of predominantly animal-sourced uh, uh, foods and some, some other foods. It's not only about emissions, of course. Water is an important part of that as, uh, uh, as well. Um, I, I think uh, you're right in saying that this... Um, should be part of the, uh, of, the, of the models and something to take into consideration. However, I do think if you look at the uh, changes in diets from uh, heavily uh, animal sourced uh, foods based uh, to predominantly plant uh, um, based, uh, the, uh, the, the change in emission, on farm emissions of those food sources is a, is a much larger um, uh, source in terms of the mitigation potential of, uh, of this. Uh, how it has an impact on uh, on supply, um, that is an interesting question. Uh, that's something that we haven't looked into, uh, into so far, but thank you for the comment. Andy first, and then probably Sonia. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Andy Haynes, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, great presentations. Congratulations to all the speakers. A couple of quick questions. Uh, you didn't say much or anything really about mental health, but we do know that, for example, exposure to floods is a very important uh, risk factor for quite long-term mental health impacts. I wonder if you could say something about the work you're doing on extreme events like floods and the mental and perhaps physical health impacts of those. The second question is about adaptation, because obviously all of these strategies, all of these findings have to lead into effective adaptation. And there are different choices. We can air condition everyone, or we can create more livable cities, more green space, more passive cooling and so on. So could you say something about how you're using this work to develop more effective um, adaptation strategies that don't add to greenhouse gas emissions. So sorry, I stepped in as a chair in the last minute, so I will take that question <laughs> for, the, for the report. So the first one, um, uh, yes, of course, this is only the four chapters that we spoke about today, but the report will have 12 chapters. And the first three reports have not done justice to some of the topics, rightly, uh, and one of them, exactly as you said, mental health. Uh, is one of them. So the other chapters do include uh, a special chapter on extreme events, which, uh, which will be, you know, temperature included, but also flooding. Uh, and we have uh, added one more chapter on emerging challenges. So droughts and wildfires will be taken care of in the emerging challenges one, because, you know, that's a little bit, uh, uh, we're a bit late on catching up on some of those topics. And then your second question about the adaptation, Andy, we did consider that the previous three reports were uh, focusing exclusively on impacts, and that's the statutory responsibility of the UK to say. Um, but our idea was also to come up with a supplement which focuses exclusively on where we are with adaptation. Now, all, not all of the adaptation can be modeled in all of the chapters, and as you saw, some of them are reviews, and we are doing our best to go more, you know, the quantification bit, but it's not easy. Uh, but yes, and we will have a separate uh, uh, supplement, hopefully, uh, which speaks to the adaptation uh, agenda and how can it do this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the room, please, or online? Uh, uh, Sonia, sorry, over to you. Yeah, no, I just had the comment actually on the transport question. Uh, so I think obviously uh, transport is an important source of emissions. For instance, in Switzerland, it's about 32% uh, of our greenhouse gas emissions. I don't know how much it is in the UK. I imagine it's similar. 
And I just wanted to say in terms of, for instance, uh, food transport, in Switzerland, uh, we have actually a law by which uh, very large uh, lorries cannot go through the country, so they are just brought onto uh, trains. And I think there, I mean, there is possibility for going to decarbonization of transport, uh, and that's one example. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, any other questions to, uh, to any of the speakers? Is there anything online which we are not able to see? Because I know that there are many people online who have joined in to this. Yeah, we've probably only got time for one more question. Um, there's a question online for, um, I think it's for Dan, and it says, how did you input city population demographics into the mortality models? Uh, yeah, so, so that's a good uh, question. I guess the initial work on this, um, it doesn't include population. Um, that's the attribution work I was talking about. And the reason is the, the shape of the heat mortality curve does change quite a lot. Um, if you include mortality, and you could understand that because uh, cities don't, when they grow in population, they don't grow sort of just outwards, they grow more dense as well, so that creates a, a different problem. So you saw from Helen's talk some of the shapes of those heat mortality curves. Um, so it's actually very hard to include that. So we didn't in the attribution work. In the projection work, then, um, uh, I guess it's more just of, a, of an estimate uh, we normally report these numbers per 100,000 population and then you sort of just scale it. That's definitely not ideal. There is work I know, again, from the London School, which is looking at including that explicitly to, to modify those curves. So, uh, Thank you, Dan. Uh, anything else, Emma, online? Uh, no. If I can possibly revert, uh, may, yes. make a comment on that, I please, think that the, the beauty of our work in uh, the UK Health Security Agency is that we don't only uh, consider uh, the, the environmental hazards, but we um, kind of uh, combine this with the, where the population is and what are the effects on, uh, on people. So it's, I think we, we can address these, uh, these type of, uh, of um, uh, of concerns, uh, like how people are affected by the the, the hazards, and um, our analysis include like population uh, data and demographics. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and as the national public health institutes are in this unique position uh, to to work, you know, with the evidence, with the processing it, and making it available to both the communities, but also the policymakers in what, what does the evidence say in terms of what action needs to be taken. So we will be having one more session, and I'm sorry I'm advertising this one, in the Health Pavilion, where we will be talking about the special role of national public health institutions in, in climate action. Uh, so I don't think there is anything online, and we are, on, we are way over time. So thank you very much first to the speakers, everybody else in the room. I think it was really good to have you all. Uh, And those online. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and looking forward to taking this work forward with all of you. Thank you. <laughs>